Ford family uh, Sunday night last week, um, and so this has been a very heavy, uh, difficult week uh, for them. The uh, funeral is this afternoon at 4 p.m. at the Life Point Church, uh, I believe, um, and then we are hoping to have the information to for the uh, GoFundMe uh, page that's been set up uh, for Veronica and Tom. Um, if you would like to give something toward that and just put it in our uh, box, just earmark it, and we'll make sure that it gets to the right place. So you're welcome to do that uh, as well uh, as a part of the part of your offering or tithes or whatever it is this morning. Um, I think that's all the announcements we have. Um, some other prayer requests, but we'll bring them up when we when we pray together. So let's begin with a psalm. Uh, we're going to begin with psalm, the first part of Psalm 40 uh, this morning. We'll let that uh, bring lead us into worship this morning. Psalm 40 has these words to say. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit and out of the miry bog and set my feet on a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud or, go, or to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare to you. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than can be counted. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. And then I said, here I am, in the scroll of the book that is written for me. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. Our great and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather in your name this morning. To hear from you, to articulate our praise to you. Uh, to once again course correct and readjust our lives so they're oriented toward your kingdom and your purposes in the world. We pray that your spirit would just inhabit this place today, that you would be with all of us, be particularly with the Ward family and their very deep grieving from this tragedy this week, um, and help us as your people uh, to come alongside them and support them in all the ways that we possibly can. But now, Lord, we give all of this time to you, and we pray that it would resound to your honor and your glory, and in your name we pray. Amen. I'd invite you to stand as we worship the Lord this morning. We stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship him now. How great, how awesome is he. And together we sing. Everyone sing.
Spirit of the Lord is here, amen? Where two or more are gathered, He is here in our midst. He is holy, we're unworthy, but by the cross, He has made us His own. He has made a way of escape.
many different names, Prince of Peace, Ancient of Days. Um, this song here is a song that we haven't done in a long time, so some of you may not know it. It's called Canons, but it, um, it's referring to that because it's talking about how, again, the music of the universe plays his melody. Um, there's constantly, you know, tension in this world, right? And then just like these guitar strings, the only reason they're going to make noise is because there's tension held between them. And so when that tension arises and we trust and we have faithfulness in him just like he had faithfulness on the cross um he will get us through and he'll he'll actually play this song right through the universe like we can see and so what's so cool is in the chorus it says you are holy great and mighty the moon and the stars declare who you are so even if we don't the universe does right and so how much greater it is to be a part of that um and the next line says i'm so unworthy but still you love me right so because again we we were fallen right we, we all know that we all um, you know, have sin in our lives, but he has redeemed us from that um, all because of what he's done. He's made us worthy. He said we were worthy of the price to send his own son to die for us. And so as we sing this next song, we're not just worshiping him for his creation and all that he's made and what is bright and beautiful, um, but also how he takes us that are so broken and makes us beautiful and, and back into the image that he originally created us to be. So let's sing this. Falling from the clouds, a strange and lovely sound. I hear it in the thunder and the rain. It's ringing in the skies like cannons in the night. The music of the universe plays. We're singing, You are.
Jesus. Well, as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning again, we want to remember uh, the Ward family uh, in this tragic loss um, and uh, all that gets disrupted when those kinds of things happen and just pray for God's peace and God's comfort. Uh, Barbara has requested prayer for her granddaughter, Dara. Is that right? Okay. Um, she's struggling with, uh, with some liver problems that are really, um, and she's only 37, but uh, there's some issues there the doctors haven't figured out. And so, uh, so we want to pray for her uh, in this, uh, in this uh, challenging time as well. Um, any report on your brother? How's he doing? Okay, so we're still in the trial stages. We've got to pray for that. Yeah. Okay, well, that's good, too. All right, good. All right. Any other prayer requests that we want to bring before the community this morning? Yeah, yeah. Okay. What's her name? Kimmy? Okay. All right. So she has liver trouble now. Scott is his name. Okay, all right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh no. In in El Salvador. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, so we'll pray for Anna and uh, Joaquin and uh, uh, Irma and all that family as well. Yeah. All right, well, let's go to the Lord as a community in prayer. Our great and gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful uh, that you are so attentive to us. Lord, you are the God of all the universe. The myriad planets and stars sing your name. The mountains and the valleys all adore you. You are so great and mighty that it would be very understandable if you didn't have time for the small little concerns that we temporary fleeting creatures bring to the table, and yet you do. Not only do you, are you aware of us, you give us each that individual love and attention of a father caring intimately about the things that change, challenge, support our world. And so, Lord, we come in both awe and gratitude that you are who you are, but that also that you have invited us. That even when we were far from you, you made all of the efforts and all of the sacrifices to build a bridge across the gap that we created to span that with your love, with your son, and bring us back to you. So, Lord, we are profoundly grateful today. And because we know who you are, because we know that you are the sovereign Lord of the universe, that you are love incarnate, that you know us and that you are faithful in ways that we can't even comprehend, then we have confidence to bring to you all of the concerns that we've got. Lord, you know, because you walked around in a body like ours, how fragile our earthly frame can be. You know that a lot of our struggles have to do with those sort of health issues. And so, Lord, we pray that you would be in all of those situations, Lord, that have been mentioned today. I pray that you would be with Dara and Kimmy in the liver struggles that they, are, that they are facing. We pray that you'd give the doctors and the nurses wisdom, that you'd find ways for treatments or transplants or whatever it is that would allow them to flourish and move forward. But also we pray that you would give them that comforting sense that even though they walk through the valley of the shadow of death, they need fear no evil because you are with them. And that whatever it is that our earthly journey comes to the end, you hold us even then in your hands and bring us to yourself. And so, Lord, we just pray for both healing and comfort and peace in situations like that. Pray that you'd be with uh, Anne's family, uh, 
be with Mike as they're still trying this cancer uh, treatment, Lord. We pray that it's going to be very effective, but we're, we're grateful that her sister is feeling so much better. Lord, we pray that you would be with uh, Hannah and Irma and Joaquin and uh, El Salvador, and uh, we pray that you especially be with Joaquin in, in the Diagnostic Center. Lord, we pray that you would just heal this quickly so that they can get back uh, from their trip. Uh, but uh, even then, Lord, we pray that you would be using it, uh, even as you always do, those disruptions in our lives, those things that feel so off, you are always able to turn them into your purposes and your kingdom. And, and Lord, we pray that that would be the case here. Pray that you'd be with Scott as he's challenged by these melanoma issues and his blood sugar. And Lord, we pray that you just help things to stabilize so that his treatments can move forward and, uh, and that he can uh, be victorious uh, in this battle against cancer. Uh, Lord, those words feel so scary, and it's very easy to feel uh, un at unease when things like this happen. But Lord, we pray that you would just be uh, a, pre a comforting presence to him, and that you would be working a healing work in his body as well. And of course, Lord, our, our thoughts are drawn to the Ward family today in this uh, profound and unexpected sense of loss. Uh, Lord, we know that the world doesn't always operate by the kinds of rules that we wish that it would. And sometimes when it happens in the news or it happens far away, we can always say, oh, gee, isn't that tragic? But when it hits close to home, then we're struck with just how unexplainable these kinds of things are. And this tragic accident and the gaping hole that it's left in the Ward family and the Evergates community and all of the people who knew Thomas and all of that. So, Lord, we just pray that your comforting presence would be with them that you'd be there in that funeral, that you would just be a, a felt presence. Uh, and that even if we can't always articulate what it will look like, we know that in you it will be okay. Uh, that you are of a way of turning tragedies into triumphs, that you will be with Veronica and the little children, and that you would guide and direct them as they're now going to have to grow up without a father. Lord, inspire your community to come around them. Uh, particularly that life point community and, uh, and encourage and uphold them. Uh, Lord, we pray that your people would be generous uh, in supporting that family and uh, the loss of this husband and, and breadwinner. And Lord, we just pray that you would be there. You know, you know what it's like to lose uh, a son. You're deeply acquainted with the griefs um, that our world inflicts on us. And you are there in the muck and the mire with us in them, but you also lift us out of those things. You turn our mourning into dancing. And so, Lord, we pray that that would be the case here. Be with all of the other members of our community that are still continuing to grieve even a year into the loss um, as we are just feeling the gap of people that are gone. Be with the Bonura family and the Ivy family and the Rios family and those others that have lost someone in grief in this past year and in even in recent days. We pray that your comfort would be with them and that you would give us the opportunity to trust again in you, even perhaps especially in those places where we don't see what the good will look like on the other side of that. And Lord, now as we turn to your word, we pray that you would just inspire your words on these pages to resound to us today, that your message, your glimpses into who you are and who we are and who you have called us to be would be clear through your word. May your spirit make it come alive for us. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen and amen. For three years uh, in the late 1990s, I had the chance to live in the country of Belgium. I was working on a postgraduate degree there. Um, and when you think of Europe, and you think of all of the sort of stereotypical touristy things that you think of Europe, Belgium is probably not the first country that comes to your mind. Uh, maybe you think about things of history, uh, maybe you think about food, maybe you think about castles, you think about cathedrals, uh, and the things that you normally think about are the big, splashy knowns that everybody knows. You know, you think about Dover Castle or um, Notre Dame in Paris. Um, you th when you think about those things, Germany, Paris, England, those are the first countries, Italy, those all come to your mind, but usually not Belgium. Belgium's a nice little tiny country tucked north of France and south and uh, west of the Netherlands. Um, it's kind of a forgotten corner of uh, Europe. But the cool thing about living in Belgium is that it has everything that Europe has to offer, just in sort of little miniature and unknown. Beautiful castles, 
amazing cathedrals, fantastic food. I used to tell people all the, the, all the tastiness of the French without the fussiness. Um, so it's a combination of French and German cuisine. So you get German proportions, but French quality, and it was awesome. If you want to go on an eating vacation to Europe, go to Belgium. Not very well known, but it has all of that in miniature. And you could have a complete European vacation. Everything's close together. Nothing's very far apart. Visit Brussels and Bruges and Ghent and Antwerp. And you'd feel like you had been to Europe. Now, I bring that up because our prophet for today, Zephaniah, is what I would think of as the Belgium of the, of the prophets. I mean, when we think of prophets, Zephaniah is probably not the first one that comes to your mind. In fact, I would wager to say that very few of you could tell me right now what the book of Zephaniah is about. Maybe you did read it at one point when you were doing your year-long read through the Bible, but you've probably forgotten it by now. And if people start asking you to name prophets, that's not going to be the first one that comes to your mind. I mean, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the big ones are there. Probably you remember Jonah. Maybe you could pick out a few other of those 12 on the list, but Zephaniah is not the one that you think of. But Zephaniah is the prophetic corpus in miniature. All of the major themes that we have been looking at in the prophets uh, are here and are put together in a wonderful order that allows us to see how the whole prophetic drive unfolds itself. Throughout these summer months, we've been exploring all of these so-called minor prophets. Minor not because they're not important, but just because they're smaller than the big guys, Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel. Um, and we've been seeing the same kinds of themes that have come out. We've been talking about how God brings out these prophets when things are going wrong, when God needs to challenge God's people and warn them of the direction in which they are heading because it is going to be a dead end street. We've talked about the wrath of God and what it means uh, for God to actually care. If you have a God of love, then de facto you have a God of wrath. A God who doesn't get angry is a God who doesn't care. And God cares very, very much. And when you can see the things that make God angry, you can see the kinds of things that God cares about. And they don't tend to be the things that we in our culture typically idolize as the important things to care about. We've seen that God is on the side of the poor and the oppressed. And what really trips God's trigger, what makes God angry, is when people exploit, consume uh, other people and use their God-given power to diminish other people rather than lift them up. Now, again, we do have to remind ourselves that God is not a biological creature like us. When, God, when we talk about God's anger or God's wrath, we're not talking about God having an involuntary response that he's going to fly off the handle and smite somebody. Um, the, God's emotions uh, are under, ununderstandable to us. Our emotions just kind of simulate those. But they are what motivate God to act, just like our emotions are what motivate us to act. And so God is motivated to act because God cares. And when God's people, even God's people, begin to misuse God's world, misuse other people created in the image of God, God cares enough to address that. And so we're going to look at the prophet Zephaniah today. It's only three chapters, and so we're just going to walk gently through each of them, uh, probably six pages in most of your Bibles. Uh, but again, the prophetic movement is so typical and classical that if you just wanted to remind yourself, what are prophets about? What are they doing? What do they care about? The wrath of God, the call to repentance, uh, the assurance that God is going to redeem Israel from their enemies, from their own malfunctions, and a call for praise at the end of it. That is the order of the book of Zephaniah. And we're going to explore that and just comment a little bit about it. Um, Zephaniah is, again, uh, writing pretty much around the same time uh, as the other prophets that we've been studying recently. Um, the big bad guy of the time, Assyria, has already taken out the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, that happens in 722. Um, Israel manages, uh, Judah, the southern kingdom, manages to avoid getting taken over, but ends up having to pay heavy tributes. Um, then Babylon comes and takes out the Assyrians, and they don't stop there, and Babylon's eventually going to come, and by 587 is going to take out Judah as well. Zephaniah is writing in the interim. He's writing when the destruction of the southern kingdom is still avoidable. There are still things that they could do to turn around from the way that they have been going. And so you hear these calls uh, for repentance and these announcements that God is not happy. 
and that God is going to be moving because the things that God cares about are being compromised. So if you can find it in your Bible, look it up in the table of contents, flip through the minor prophets. Once you find Habakkuk, you're almost there. Um, The book of Zephaniah. Uh, We're going to listen to what the word of the Lord has to say there. Zephaniah, beginning with the first chapter and the first verse. The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of King Josiah, son of Ammon of Judah. Now, just by the way, Hezekiah is not a very common name uh, in the scripture. The fact that um, uh, Zephaniah is in, has Hezekiah as one of his forefathers, probably indicates that he's got some royal lineage or blood. Um, Hezekiah was the guy who was king when Isaiah uh, was doing a lot of his prophecy. Uh, so it's very possible that Zephaniah is, has some connection uh, to the royal family. Uh, that's a, not a very common name, so we can, we can, we're allowed to assume that he's got something of that privileged perspective that he's bringing to the table. And this is what God tells him to say. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, says the Lord. I will sweep away humans and animals. I will sweep away the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. I will make the wicked stumble. I will cut off humanity from the face of the earth, says the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off from this place every remnant of Baal and the names of the idolatrous priests, those who bow down on the roofs to the hosts of heaven, those who bow down and swear to the Lord but also swear to Milcom, those who have turned back from following the Lord and who have not sought the Lord or inquired of him. So the book of Zephaniah begins with a really dark pronouncement. And like so many of the prophets, um, we have to hear this in the right way. God basically says through Zephaniah that he's going to destroy everything. I will wipe off humanity from the entire face of the earth. That is, by the way, exactly what God said before the Noah star story started. That's it. I've had it. All of the human beings are nothing but miserable. I'm going to wipe them out completely. God announces how he feels, and God announces God's intention. But again, we have to be very careful with these prophecies. They are telling us about who God is. They are not giving us newspaper reports of future events, because this didn't happen. <laughs> God did not wipe out everything from the face of the earth. In fact, God promised after the Noah story that he would never do that again. But you need to hear very clearly that God is fed up. (laughs) He is fed up with the way that people are acting. And the particular thing that is sticking in his craw right now is the false religion. It is the false religion that is the core of what he's saying there. I'm gonna get rid of the idolatrous priests. I'm gonna get rid of all those people who follow idols. Yes, they do pray to the Lord. They do ask things of him, but they're also following other gods. And the perpetual problem that Israel had always had, the one that God is always poking them for, is they keep wanting to pay the God and game. The God and game. We want God. But we also want good crops, and so maybe it'd be a good idea to sacrifice to Baal, too, just to sort of hedge our bets. We want God, but we also want, you know, victory in battle. And so maybe getting a few of these other battle gods on our side wouldn't be a bad idea, right? Um, It's the God and game. We want God and Baal. We want God and Milcom. We want God and power. We want God and money. We want God and fame. We, We know the drill. We want to fit God into the other things, but also hedge our bets so that, you know, if God doesn't come through to us, we've, we've got options, right? And, and that just reveals Israel's faithlessness. Because the God and game for Israel never works. <laughs> the ands always become more important. And God is only gets to be God when he gets to be God exclusively. So that's the gripe. Now, again, God is announcing God's intention, but we all know God's not going to fulfill that intention. Because even though God feels that way, God's merciful nature is always stronger than his judging nature. And God's wrath is always redemptive, not merely destructive. But we have to keep that in mind. God's fed up. And what he's fed up at is this God and false religion thing. Verse 7. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. And on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and their king's sons and all who dress themselves in foreign attire. On that day, I will punish all those who leap over the threshold, who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. 
On that day, says the Lord, a cry will be heard from the fish gate and a wail from the second quarter, a loud crash from the hills. The inhabitants of the mortar will wail and for all the traitors have perished. All who weigh out silver are cut off. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps and I will punish the people who rest complacently on their dregs and who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do harm. Their wealth will be plundered, their houses laid waste. Though they will build houses, they will not inhabit them. Though they will plant vineyards, they will not drink from them, drink wine from them. Again, the, the feeling that the people have is that God really doesn't care. God's not involved. God, we can do our own thing because God's just going to go off and do God's own thing. God won't do good and he won't do evil. He's just not a player. So we're just kind of on our own here. And God's like, wrong. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm very much involved. I do care very much. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. Verse 14, the sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The warrior cries aloud there. That day will be a day of wrath a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring such distress upon people that they will walk around like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood will be poured out like dust, their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of his passion, the whole earth will be consumed for a full and terrible end he will make to all the inhabitants of the earth. Again, God's kind of fed up with that. And God highlights, and here he talks about silver and gold, but the problem with that God and game is that those other ands can't protect you from God when you transgress the boundary lines and violate the things that God finds to be important. Go ahead and put your faith in Baal. He can't save you from Yahweh. Go ahead and put your faith in Milcom. Good luck when Yahweh shows up. Go ahead and put your faith in money. Go ahead and put your faith in power. Go ahead and put your faith in all of the and things that even today we struggle with, adding to God. And when we use those things to violate the things that God values and God cares about that so deeply that God's like, that's not going to help you. Your silver and your gold are not going to worth, be worth very much when you show up on the judgment day whenever that happens to happen. So then that's the looming threat. And it's given in very unambiguous, almost hyperbolic terms, right? God is mad at Israel. That, that's very clear that this whole thing is about Israel. But the sweep of God's wrath is against everybody. The difference is that Israel's going to have a chance to turn away. They know God. They know what they should be doing. And so after you have this declaration of God's intention of wrathful judgment, because people have violated the things that God knows are important, you immediately then get a call to turn around. Avoid this judgment. Fix the things. Chapter 2. Gather together. Gather, O shameless nation. Notice that's singular, that's Israel. Before you are driven away like drifting shaft, before there comes upon you the fierce anger of the Lord, before there comes upon you the day of the Lord's wrath. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land who do his commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the Lord's wrath. Again, he doesn't give them any guarantees, but he only tell, he tells them your only path to security is to turn back wholeheartedly to God. Nothing else can save you. So turn around. Yes, God has announced an unambiguous destruction, but he did that with Nineveh too, remember? If we've been reading through, we've already read Jonah by this point. God tells Nineveh, you're going to be destroyed 40 days. And they say to themselves, ah, let's turn around and maybe God will show God's favor. There's this, always that possibility that the merciful nature of God is going to be greater than the judging nature of God. And if you turn around, you can be redeemed. And here, now Zephaniah switches to how God is going to deal with all of the enemies of Judah. And it begins with a big four. So because, right? So you should turn around because you have seen and will see what my wrath looks like on all of these nations that don't care about anything that I care about. For Gaza shall be deserted and Ashkelon will become a desolation. Ashdod's people will be driven out at noon and Ekron will be uprooted. All the inhabitants of the seacoast, you nation of the Cherethites, the word of the Lord is against you. 
O Canaan, land of the Philistines, I will destroy you until no inhabitant is left. And you, O seacoast, will be pastures and meadows for shepherds and folds for flocks. The seacoast will become a possession of the remnant of the house of Judah, on which they shall pastor. And in the houses of Ascalon, they will lie down at evening. For the Lord, their God, will be mindful of them and will restore their fortune. Um, notice that key word remnant. That's a big, important word in the prophetic corpus. God's judgment is going to come, but it will not be as complete as he threatens. And we're going to talk about why, because Zephaniah is going to give us that clue. There'll be a bit left. God will not completely destroy God's people. And they will be redeemed. And they will have whatever's left over because everybody else has been judged by God. Verse 8, I have heard the taunts of Moab and the revilings of the Ammonites, how they taunted my people and made boasts against their territory. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Moab will become like Sodom and the Ammonites like Gomorrah, a land possessed by nettles and salt pits, a waste forever. And the remnant of my people shall plunder them, and the survivors of my nation shall possess them. This shall, not be, this shall be their lot in return for their pride, because they have scoffed and boasted against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be terrible against them. He will shrivel all the gods of the earth, and to him shall bow down, each in its place, all the coasts and the islands and of the nation. God will be God over all. Also, you Ethiopians will be killed by the sword. He will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria. He will make Nineveh a desolation, a dry waste like a desert. Herds will lie down on it. Every wild animal, desert owl, screech owl, shall lodge on its capitals. The owl shall hoot at the window, the ravens crock on the threshold, and the cedar work will, and the, it, its cedar work will be laid bare. Is this the exultant cry that lives secure, that said to itself, I am, and there is no one else? What a desolation it has become, a lair for wild animals. Everyone who passes by it will hiss and shake their fist. So again, God is pointing out to them, whether at this point we don't know exactly the time frame of Zephaniah, that this is a prophecy of Nineveh's fall or an observation of look at what just happened to nations that don't follow God. Because whatever, uh, um, whatever repentance Nineveh had expressed, they apparently lost it pretty quickly because everything goes back to the way that it was. Look around you. You know that I'm serious. You know that I care about these things. Do something now so that this calamity doesn't come on you. So again, you have that pronouncement of God's wrath. You've got the call to repentance. You have the hope that God will destroy all of Israel's enemies and the remnant will be left. Now he cycles back in chapter 3 uh, to, again, putting Israel in God's sight, Judah. Ah, soiled, defiled, oppressing city. He's talking about Jerusalem here. Um, how they have, you know, again, become one of those just like everybody else in the world, grasping, oppressing, diminishing other people. It has listened to no voice. It has accepted no correction. It is not trusted in the Lord, and it has not drawn near to its God. The officials within it are roaring lions. Its judges are evening wolves that leave nothing left till morning. Its prophets are reckless, faithless persons. Its priests have profaned what is sacred, and they have done violence to the law. The Lord within it is righteous. He does no wrong. Every morning he renders his judgment, each dawn without fear, but the unjust knows no shame. I have cut off nations. Their battlements are in ruin. I have laid waste to their streets so that no one walks on them. Their cries have been made desolate without people, without inhabitants. I said, surely the city, that's Jerusalem, will fear me. It will accept correction. It will not lose sight of all that I have brought upon it. Look around you. See all the judgment that I have already brought. See that I'm serious about the things that I care about. But they were the more eager to make their deeds corrupt. It doesn't stop them. They see what God cares about and they don't care. I'm afraid there's a little bit of a warning in that for us as well. Therefore, wait for me, says the Lord. For on the day when I arise as a witness, my decision is to gather the nations, to assemble the kingdoms, and to pour out on them my indignation, the heat of all my anger. For in the fire of my passion, all the earth will be consumed. And at that time, I will change the speech of peoples to a pure speech. All of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, my scattered ones, shall bring my offering. 
On that day, you will not be put to shame because of all the deeds by which you have rebelled against me, for I will remove them from your midst, your proudly exalted ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. For I will leave in the midst of you a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord, the remnant of Israel. They will do no wrong and utter no lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found on their mouths, and they will pasture and lie down, and no one will make them afraid. So the tunneling of God's wrath, the focus of what God is going to do when God shows up in anger, isn't utter and complete destruction. It's redemption. That the fire of God's wrath, Zephaniah wants you to know, is a purging fire. When I show up on the day of the Lord, God says, I am going to pour out my wrath. And what that's going to do is purge away all of the bad, leaving the pure and refined good. I will leave in the midst of them a people that is humble and lowly. I will burn away the pride or the proudful ones. I will burn away all of the things that make people move away from God. And again, it's all the nations that are encompassed here, not just Israel. Israel was always supposed to be that point person, right? That symbol for God to reach all of the world. As you remember God's promise to Abraham, I'm going to bless you, and in you all of the nations of the world will be blessed. Israel is a channel for God's worldwide redemption. They are not the only so focus of God's redemption, and God is very clear about that. I will pour out my wrath. I will get rid of the things that are against what I care about, but I'm not going to destroy everything completely. My wrath is purgative, not merely destructive. God doesn't destroy because he's angry. God gets rid of the things that move against what God cares about. And so the, psalm, the, the prophet then ends with a note of rejoicing. After starting off with this dark and depressing, God's just going to destroy everything because everything is so bad. We said, no, no, God's purpose is always redemptive. God will purge us. God will save us even from ourselves. Verse 14, chapter 3. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout. O Israel, rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgment against you. He has turned away your enemies. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst, and you shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said in Jerusalem, do not fear, O Zion, do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord, your God, is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. I will deal with all of your oppressors at that time. I will save the lame and gather the outcast. I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you home. At that time, when I gather you, for I will make you renown and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. And so the prophet Zephaniah finishes up with that call that says, hey, do you realize that the wrath of God is actually good news? Do you realize that because God cares and because God's going to act, that the end result of all of that's going to be good and not bad? Again, for those who will position themselves on God's side, God's wrath is a redemptive thing, something to be celebrated because Thank God, God cares. The alternative, what the other people were saying before, is that, yeah, God doesn't care. God's off doing his own thing. He's not going to do anything, good or evil. He's absent. He doesn't care. And if that were true, we'd all be hopeless. But the good news is that God cares. But the bad news is that God cares. <laughs> but the good news about that is that God cares. And once again, we are invited by these prophets to get rid of those things that are moving against the purposes and plans of God, to start caring about the things that God cares about, to reorient ourselves, not to get God on our side, but to get ourselves on God's side. And then we are in that stream of redemption. Then we are in that stream, even in ourselves, where we're like, Lord, I know that I do this, and it makes you mad, and I'm sorry, and I really just want you to get rid of it. 
I mean, in some way, that is what the entire doctrine of holiness and sanctification is about, is letting God's critical judgment in as deep as we can let it so that he takes away from us all of our, what does he can say, take away our bent to sinning. All the ways in which we want to twist the world so that it serves us and ends up diminishing the lives of other people. God's like, you're miserable when you do that. I get miserable when you do that. You make other people miserable when you do that. Can we purge it away? Is it going to be painful? Oh, yes. God's purging fire is fire. But the end result is good. And if God is trustworthy, then we can trust him even with his anger, even with his wrath, even when we find ourselves as individuals, communities, nations, the whole earth, on the receiving end of that wrath. We're like, all right, well, God's going to do something with this. How do I let it purge? And again, when you see the kind of redemption that Zephaniah is offering, it's not that God's like, all right, I'm going to make sure that all of those wealthy and famous and powerful people are, you know, getting what they want. No, when God talks about that restored, purged nation, the people that get highlighted are the lame and the outcast. The people that have been shamed by the world become renowned in the realm of God. What more indication? And again, it comes up so often in the scripture that the things that God values and the things that the world values don't line up very often. But the things that God values will be protected and redeemed. And those that oppress the things that God values will be dealt with. So the stream is clear which direction it's heading, what it is that God cares about, what it is that God wants. We just have to decide if we're going to be carried with it in the direction that God wants to go. Or we're going to try to face the other way and get absolutely overwhelmed by the flood. It's our choice. But the decisions are clear. Our gracious Heavenly Father, it sounds weird to say this, but we're grateful for your wrath. Just because we know that you care. Lord, you know us. You know how easy it is for us to get distracted by things in this world that serve our comfort, our pleasure, our convenience. And we end up caring more about ourselves than we do about others. And Lord, we know that when we do that, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, we end up on the side of the oppressor. We end up being those who take value away from other people in order to give it to themselves. We don't want that. That's not who we want to be. We want to be people that are reflecting your image, an image of love, an image that prioritizes the good of the other, even when it may cause us hurt. That's really where we find our true meaning, really where we find our true happiness. Lord, we try to be happy on our own, and it makes us miserable. So, Lord, we are grateful that you don't let us get away with that. We're grateful for the times that you chastise us and correct us because we know that you have our ultimate long-term best interests at heart. You know that your only goal for us is to stop us from hurting ourselves. So, Lord, we pray that especially in these moments that you just show us those places where wittingly or unwittingly we put ourselves against the stream of your wrath and help us to cling on to the promises that if we will offer and surrender those things to you, however painful they may be, and step into the stream of your love and value and be part of what it is that you're doing in the world, that you will bring your ultimate redemption to the world and, Lord, even through us. We thank you and we praise you for all of these truths. And in your name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand.
was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace. Chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing. when we think about those chains from which God frees us, we think about being bound to something else. But if you think about it, the chains that we're being bound by are just to ourselves. It's like we're in handcuffs, bound to ourselves, shackles that just tie our ankles together. We're not bound to anything but us. And when God breaks them, where we're no longer our first concern, then that frees us up to be the, exactly what God has called us to be. Receive now this benediction. Go in God's grace and peace as emblems and examples of the redemptive love of God. Thank you for coming. You are dismissed. We have Sunday school afterwards. We'd invite you to join us. And again, if you would like to donate uh, to the Ward family to help them through the GoFundMe, that is, oh, you did get it up there. Wonderful. We'll leave the QR code for the GoFundMe page there. You can also leave anything that you want with us in our little offering house, and we will make sure it gets to the right place. Go in his grace and peace. Thank you so much.